welcome back class. We are talking about the anatomy of cells and this is chapter four, part two. We have discussed kind of some differences of eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells, some similarities they have. And now we're going to jump into our prokaryotic cells specifically. Um, and we're gonna start from the outside in. What kind of stuff do they have outside their cell? Um, all the way into their cell wall. And then in our next video, we'll talk about what's inside their cell wall. So outside of the cell wall, they have things like glycocalyx, flagella, axial filaments, fimbriae, and pili. So the glycocalyx would be like this sugar coat around it. Flagella would be these long things that help it move. Axial filaments and fimbriae would be these kind of hairy structures around it. And pili would be this kind of long pokey thing here. So glycocalyx is just a generic term for sugary stuff around a cell. Um, it's usually made of some kind of sugar, a polysaccharide, maybe a peptide, polypeptide mixed in it. If it's firmly attached to the cell wall, it's called a capsule. And capsules have a lot of medical importance because they kind of help that cell hide from your immune system. So your white blood cells are just going around your body trying to look for germs. Um, and if they find a germ, they're going to eat it. That's called phagocytosis, when a white blood cell digests any sort of bacterial cell. However, if, a bacteria, if your white blood cell comes to a bacteria that's covered with a capsule, it just comes up and says, oh look, some sugar, how sweet, and goes about its way. So a bacteria that has a capsule will avoid phagocytosis. That means it won't be killed by your immune system. That means it's gonna grow and make a worse infection. So capsules contribute to virulence. They allow bacteria to grow when they would otherwise be killed by the immune system. An extra polymeric substance or EPS is a sugar coat around a cell that helps that cell um, attach into a biofilm. So it, that biofilm allows cells to work together to protect each other and protect the cells within it. We've already mentioned biofilms a little bit although we'll come back and talk about them a little bit more um, in, just throughout this whole semester, we'll come back to them a few times. Flagella are these long appendages outside of a cell that help a bacteria move. And we classify a cell based on what kind of flagella it has. If it has no flagella, it is atricus. So A means none, atricus bacteria have no flagella. Peri, so peri means around, like a perimeter, um, anything that goes around something is peri something. So peritrichous bacteria have flagella distributed around the whole thing. So this bacteria, if you look at it, you can see flagella around the whole thing. That's peritrichous. Polar means that the flagella are at one or both ends or poles of a cell. So here flagella are just at the end, flagella are at both ends. Here are flagella at one end. So those three cells are all polar. A monotrichous bacteria has one, mono meaning one, has one flagella, and that flagella is almost always going to be at its pole. So this bacteria is monotrichous, it has one flagella, and it's polar because it's at the pole. Lophotrichous, I have no word to compare lofo to, I'm sorry. If you can think of something, please share with the class. Lophotrichous bacteria have a tuft. So here you have a, just a big chunk of flagella, a whole bunch of them. So this bacteria is lophotrichous with that tuft of, of flagella. It's also polar because it's at its pole. And amphi, this prefix amphi means, means both ways. So like an amphibian lives in water and on land. An amphibious vehicle can drive on water and in land. Somebody who is ambidextrous can write with both hands. So amphi means both ways. So this amphitrichous bacteria has, bac has flagella at both ends, um, this end and that end, both ways. It's also polar because those flagella are at the poles. So please be able to describe these terms. Those are terms you should be very comfortable with at this point. Flagella allow a bacteria to move and they are going to twist in a circle one way and then the other way. So you can see it twists this way and then it kind of twists the other way. It does these things called run and tumble. So run is a movement in one direction and then tumble is when it kind of just kind of shakes itself out to make sure it's moving the direction it needs to be. So eventually through this, it moves in one random direction 
and then shuffles out until it finally figures out that it's going the way it wants to go. Um, this movement is called taxis. So just like a taxi will move you around, taxis is how a bacteria moves. And it'll either move towards a stimulus, so positive taxis is moving towards something, moving towards a food so source, towards a light stimulus, or a negative taxis would be moving away from something. So moving away from something harmful. It doesn't want the light. It doesn't want that chemical. Maybe it's a chemical like an antibiotic that would kill it. It can move away from it. Axial filaments are internal flagella. They are inside of a cell. So sometimes they're called endoflagella. Here, this is it wrapping around and around and around a cell. You can see it wrapping around and around and around. This yellowish in this, in this picture is the axial filament. Axial filaments are located in spirochetes. So the difference between a spirochete and a spirilla is a spirochete has an axial filament and a spirilla would have those, those flagella outside of it. This axial filament can twist around, um, kind of like a corkscrew allows a cell to move. One type of, of spirochete that uses axial filaments is Treponema pallidum. This is the bacteria that causes syphilis. Bacteria also have fimbriae, these kind of like crazy haircut, choppy things all around it. Fimbriae are good at sticking, so they can let bacteria stick to each other. They can let bacteria stick to surfaces. A uh, cell could have a couple of fimbriae just at the poles. It could have hundreds of them all over the entire cell. And another kind of thing that can exist outside of the cell is a pili. Um, at the start of this chapter, I called it some kind of pokey thing. It's kind of like how bacteria have sex with each other. They kind of poke each other with it. Um, so sometimes they're called conjugation pili or sex pili because two bacteria will attach to each other and not just stick together, but they'll actually transfer their DNA from one cell to the other cell. So this DNA that this cell has, if it has DNA to survive penicillin, it can pass it over here, and now they're both penicillin resistant. Typically, a cell will only have one or two pili, not all cells have pili, but they can share the DNA to be able to make pili with each other. Um, pili may be involved in motility, but really what we're talking about here is conjugation, transferring DNA between different cells. Then the next level inside of a cell, um, we've now come to the cell wall. Cell wall is made of peptidoglycan in bacteria or pseudomurine in archaea. These are complex because they're proteins and sugars made in a very specific order, pretty rigid, and almost all prokaryotes will have a cell wall. They help give a cell its shape. So just like if you were growing watermelon and you put that watermelon in a box, that box is going to control the shape of your watermelon, that cell wall is going to control the shape of your cell the same way. It prevents osmotic lysis. So osmotic lysis is when water flows into a cell until the cell bursts. So having that cell wall just pushes against it. Just like if you were holding a, a water balloon, you could stop too much water from flowing into it because you just push excess water out. That cell wall pushes excess water out so that it doesn't burst. The cell wall helps anchor flagella. So these flagella aren't going to just twist off and fly off. They're securely connected in this cell wall. It also protects the plasma membrane. So it wraps around the outside of the plasma membrane so it prevents some chemicals and things from getting to the plasma membrane and causing disease. The cell wall, I mean, it protects things from getting to the plasma membrane and, and attacking the plasma membrane. The cell wall contributes to the ability of a cell to cause disease, especially in our gram-negative bacteria. The cell wall actually has chemicals in it that can make you sick, just the cell wall itself. Even if the cell itself were dead, just the presence of those chemicals in the cell wall can make you have a fever and feel unwell. The cell wall is also the site of action for some antibiotics, especially penicillin. So peptidic glycan is going to be layers of sugars and proteins. So here you have these rows of sugars, and you can see there's two different kinds of sugars here, um, kind of the rusty red and the more pinkish red. The rusty red is called NAG, and the pinkish one is NAM. So it's nag, nam, nag, nam, nag, nam. You just have this disaccharide polymers. Um, and then you'll have a layer of peptides, so a layer of a protein. 
Then you can have more layers of sugars, more layers of proteins, more layers of sugars, more layers of proteins. You can make a nice thick cell wall even. When we're looking at cell walls of a gram-positive cell, it's going to be nice and thick. So you can see we've got several layers of, of sugar, several layers of proteins, nice and thick. And that thickness is going to cause it to be really rigid. And then there's no membrane outside of it. There's no outer membrane. So this cell wall is going to be susceptible to things like penicillin and lysozyme. They can just get it right in here, break down that, those um, peptidic glycan, and, and ruin your cell. This, however, is a gram-negative cell. And instead of having thick peptidic glycan, you have a thin layer of peptidic glycan. And outside of that, you have an outer membrane. That outer membrane helps prevent phagocytosis. So your immune system can't recognize any peptidic glycan because it's hidden. So it, it prevents phagocytosis. It also is a barrier to antibiotics. So antibiotics can't get in and destroy the cell wall because that outer membrane blocks it. It has porins in it. Porins are these little holes that let things go in. And it also has these compounds called lipid A. Lipid A all by itself will make you sick. This is called an endotoxin. If you were to destroy this cell and that cell burst and that lipid A went free all over your body, you would feel really sick um, while that until your body cleared that out. Gram-negative cells also have a periplasmic space. That means a cell, but the space that the cell has between the two membranes. This is your periplasmic space. So in a gram stain, in a gram-positive cell, when you stain with peptidic glycan, um, that peptidic glycan kind of gets trapped in all of these layers of, of your, I'm sorry, you stain with crystal violet, which gets trapped in all these layers of peptidic glycan. When you add the iodine, it forms these really big crystals, and the alcohol then dehyd dehydrates that peptidic glycan, so that crystal violet is trapped. So your gram-positive cell is going to be purple in a gram stain, that purpley blue. However, in your gram-negative cell, your alcohol is going to rip away this outer membrane. It, it just is destroyed by alcohol. There's not enough peptidoglycan to trap your crystal violet, so your crystal violet just floats away. It gets rinsed off. And then it has to be restained with your counter stain, with your safranin. So your gram-negative cell will appear pink. So at this point, you know how it, what a gram stain does. We talked about all the steps of, in each process in Chapter 3. Now we talked about the anatomy of a cell, how gram-positive and gram-negative cells are different, and how that anatomy allows them to, be, to react differently to a gram stain. So you should be very comfortable discussing everything about a gram stain. Um, if it's any, any detail in Chapter 3 or 4 lecture, you need to be able to tell me about it in your exam. Then there are a few cells that are a little bit different. We talked about acid-fast cells. Um, acid-fast cells are kind of similar to gram-positive, but they throw in this chemical called mycolic acid. Mycolic acid is waxy. It's this waxy fat that's, that will stick to the peptidic glycan, and it is in mycobacterium and nocardia. So you can stain these cells with an acid-fast stain. Mycoplasmas don't have a cell wall. This plasma tells you they have a plasma membrane, and that's it. So they won't be affected by any kind of um, antibiotic that destroys a cell wall. It just won't affect those. Mycoplasmas add sterols into their plasma membrane to prevent water from flowing in and bursting their cells. And then archaea have no cell wall or have a cell wall made of pseudomurine. Cell walls can be damaged. They can be damaged by chemicals like lysozyme. Lysozyme is a a chemical found in tears, mucus, saliva, a lot of your body fluids that will ruin the sugar part of the peptidic glycan. Penicillin, which is a natural antibiotic, will ruin the peptide part of the cell wall. So either way, you have destroyed your peptidic glycan, left your cell um, susceptible to damage, to having um, especially osmotic lysis. If you have a gram-positive cell that has lost its cell wall, it's called a protoplast. A gram-negative cell wall that has lost a gram-negative cell that has lost its cell wall is a spheroplast. Both of them can fill with water and burst. And an L form is a cell that has lost its cell wall and has swollen into a weird shape, so it becomes an L form. 
Okay, so at this point you can tell me, why are bacterial capsules medically important? How do bacteria move? How do bacteria transfer DNA between different cells? Why are drugs that target cell wall synthesis useful? Why are mycoplasmas resistant to antibiotics that interfere with cell wall synthesis? And how do protoplasts differ from L forms? Okay, um, I'll see you back for our next lecture when we talk about what's going on from the cell membrane and inside the cell. See you later. Bye.